I am one of the, uh, I wear many hats in the Exascale computing program. For the purposes of this talk, I am the lead for the software ecosystem and delivery uh, activity inside of the Exascale computing program. <coughs> and today I was going to give you a brief overview about the Exascale program itself as well as some of the software strategies that we're using in order to deliver a performance software stack on the Exascale machines. So <coughs> just to give you a brief overview, so for those of you who don't know, the Exascale computing program is a $1.88 billion program over seven years uh, funded by the Department of Energy, among other departments. It funds about 1,000 researchers at this point in time. Uh, <clears throat> the mission of the Exascale Computing Program is really to deliver an Exascale computing pro uh, computer on the floor by 2021 and 2022 and mm -hmm. make sure that we have everything in place in order to run the applications at scale as well as all the software required to run them. So the Exascale Computing Program itself is part of a larger initiative our specific fo focus is really on developing the Exascale Ready applications, providing the sustainable and integrated software stack, and also delivering uh, some of this technology to the vendors to deploy on the end scale, on the products at the end of the time, uh, to deploy on the systems that are actually put on the floor. So the Exascale Computing Initiative itself is, consists of three parts. One is the Exascale Computing Project itself, which is funding the applications and software stack. We have some delivery elements. So in terms of the actual machines themselves, that's the procurement side run by the facilities at uh, Oak Ridge, Argonne, and at, in the NNSA laboratories, so the National uh, Nuclear uh, Security Administration. And we also fund, get some funding for uh, the program offices to develop for application development. So we have partners across the uh, DOE, across the US government. So we have partnerships with the NSF, DOE, and the Office of Science. So there are three particular areas within the Exascale Computing Project itself. Those are application development, software technologies, and hardware and integration. So I reside right in the middle. So yesterday somebody talked about the sponge model with the layers, this is the sandwich model, and so were the peanut butter in the middle of the two <laughs> slices of bread. Now some of the applications may be allergic to peanut butter, and some of the hardware vendors may be allergic to peanut butter, but we're the peanut butter in the middle uh, in any case. So just to give you an idea, from the application development side, we're really trying to deliver performant applications on the exascale computing uh, platforms themselves. We fund uh, 24 applications at this stage, and they are spread across national security, energy, earth systems, economic security, materials, and data. And I'll give you an overview of the uh, actual uh, applications themselves in just a second. The hardware and integration is on the other side. So this is actually working with the vendors uh, in order to deliver the applications and the software technology on the machines that are put on the floor. We also fund a little bit of NRE uh, for the vendors, so that gets integrated inside of the uh, products that are delivered. Software technology is in the middle, and we have a portfolio of projects for software technologies. There are 67 software products. They are spread into 33 different uh, project elements themselves. So to give you an idea of the application, so we have many applications. They're spread across at least, six, they're spread across six areas. They include national security applications all the way to healthcare. The healthcare application is uh, related to cancer research. That's where we have our main component in terms of artificial intelligence. So we do some AI work inside of the healthcare application. We have the standard applications uh, in terms of seismic modeling, cosmology, uh, confined plasmas, and the earth system models. So our applications span a wide range of applications of interest to the Department of Energy as well as of interest to the uh, U.S. government. Uh, I'm not sure what else I want to say on this slide other than there are a lot of applications that we have to support. Those applications will run on three machines that are going to be delivered in the 2021 to 2023 time frame. So those are Frontier, which is out at Oak Ridge, which is a Cray AMD machine. Aurora is out at, in, 
at Argonne National Laboratory, which is an Intel Crave machine. And then El Capitan will be uh, the National Nuclear Security Administration machine, which will, be, which will be hosted at Los Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. It's a Cray machine, or Cray is actually putting it out there, but they haven't told us what the actual architecture is going to be for that particular machine itself. And then we have a pre-exascaled machine, Perlmutter, which will be due to be delivered in 2020, which is a Cray, AMD, and NVIDIA machine, uh, which we plan to run some of our pre-exascale applications on itself. So the focus today, and my particular area inside of the Exascale computing program is on the software technology stack. And as I said, we are the peanut butter in the middle between the application development and the hardware. So the, uh, as you would imagine with a large project, we have a large leadership team. They're a highly capable and highly qualified leadership team who run uh, the projects in various areas. So I don't want to go through everybody, I just wanted to say that I am a small part in a very large uh, leadership team related to the Exascale Computing Project. And this is just within the software technology area. There's another team for applications, another team for hardware. So the goal of the uh, software technology is to really provide a comprehensive, coherent software stack so that application developers can use that software stack and it will perf be performant and that we can deliver it on the Exascale machines when they are put on the floor. So we really are targeting that as our goal, is to provide the software technologies to the applications and to deliver them on day one on the machines when they're put on the floor. So we do this by extending current technologies where possible. We perform some research and development for new approaches. Uh, we guide and complement, and we also provide software to the vendor efforts, and we develop and deploy our uh, high quality software products. So there are four basic elements to the ECP software strategy. This is not all of them, but this is my take on the software strategy. Now, there are rocket sciences, scientists inside of the Exascale Computing Program. This is not a rocket scientist strategy. This is sort of a very basic uh, strategy that you would find uh, pretty much any place. So our software strategy really is to invest in a diverse portfolio. So we fund a lot of projects. There's 66, 67 software technologies that we fund yearly and every six months we look at gaps and we identify and fill gaps by funding new projects within the Exascale Computing Software Initiative. And we do this to mitigate risks. So as a project, we have key deliverables and one of our key deliverables is to make sure the applications run on those machines. In order to run on the machines, we need to mitigate the risk that some of the software may not be performant on those machines. The other part of our strategy has to do with integrating the software in order to foster community development. So we really want to foster open source communities and packages, uh, integrated software packages. We want to simplify the delivery and deployment of those packages on the Exascale machines. <coughs> and at the end of the day, we want to focus on developer productivity and software sustainability. And I'll spend a little bit of time on the productivity and software sustainability at the end. The real goal is that the Exascale Computing Project will end in 2023. Our software technologies have to live beyond the 2023 timeframe. And so that's where we talk about sustainability and our strategy for uh, what happens after the Exascale Computing Project ends. So strategy number one inverse. Invest in a diverse portfolio, identify gaps, and fill them and mitigate risks. So we do this by funding uh, a number of projects within uh, each of the uh, activities. So there are six basic activities that we have inside of the Exascale Computing Software stack. There's programming models and runtime, there's development tools, there's map libraries, we do data and visualization, we support the software ecosystem, and then we support national security uh, needs through the software stack. Now, what, I, what do I mean by diversity? Diversity comes in many forms. So if you look within, say, the data and visualization area, we support many different I.O. products. We support HDF5, we support Audios, we support PNET CDF. So we have activities in all of those areas in order to make sure that we have at least one performant I.O. system on the uh, machines that are delivered. We also support both open MPI and MPitch. So 
In that particular case, we're funding two products that do the same thing, primarily because they focus on different optimizations. One optimized product may be better for Aurora, and the other optimized product may be better for Frontier. And we can't tell ahead of time which one is going to be performant on which machine, so we fund activities in both of them, knowing that at the end of the day, one of those will be selected and will be performant on each of the machines that we adopt. So in identifying gaps, we actually do a gap analysis every year and we do fund new projects and we have done some consolidation of the projects themselves. So it's sort of the standard approach where we identify gaps, we scope a response, we execute the change and then we monitor progress. This has led to some new activities in terms of funding hyper for preconditioning and solving linear systems of equations. We have new support for scalable Fourier transforms. We have a new project that started earlier this year in terms of packaging technologies, which involves both uh, development of SPAC as well as our container effort. And we have new funding in fiscal year 20 for some multi-precision math libraries. So we are very cognizant of the fact that we do have gaps in our software technology where possible we go and fund new activities within those gaps. Okay, so we have a broad range of software that we develop. How do we integrate those together and foster community development? So the way that we integrate software to, uh, technology together is through this notion of software development kits. And so the software development kits are packages of related software that are sort of grouped together that provide similar uh, capabilities and may have common APIs and be integrated more tightly together. So the SDKs are really our first line of, of defense or our first line in terms of integrating packages together. So for example, inside of the a data and IO space, we have a data software development kit that is being built on top of the HDF5 API. And so all of the uh, applications will have some support for HDF5 API uh, at, some, at some level. So we group similar products together, we make them interoperable where possible, and we assure policy compliance. Uh, we also include external products. So if there are products not part of the Exascale computing program, we also are able and willing to integrate those in to the SDKs where they make sense. So we are not prescriptive about the SDKs. We let the individual areas determine the policies and what actual applications fit within the SDKs themselves. So we wanted to make this more of a community building uh, activity as well as an integration activity for what makes sense. So the software development kits are the key delivery vehicle for the ECP software. They have domain scope. So we have collections that make functional sense so they all work together and the SDK itself makes sense. There are five SDKs in programming models and runtimes, tools and technologies, compilers, math libraries, data and visualization and data management. So in terms of the interaction, how the packages interact within an SDK is dependent upon the SDK itself. Uh, sometimes they're compatible, sometimes they have a similar API, sometimes they're complementary, and sometimes they just are interoperable with each other. Sometimes it's even a challenge to make sure that they can be used by a single application. So we, we do those activities as well. We wanna foster community policies. So we have a set of community policies that are determined by the SDKs themselves uh, as a way to sort of guarantee, uh, have a low bar for membership within an SDK. These are things like we provide a SPAC recipe we don't export MPI global or the MPI com world, things like that. We combine these together into SPAC packages, so meta packages within SPAC, and we provide shared test suites. So all of the SDKs will be tested at the end using our continuous integration testing in order to provide more confidence to both the facilities and the applications that these packages will run and they will run at scale. We have inter-package planning, and we have some community outreach in terms of tutorials, uh, documentation, and best practices. So SDK is both a horizontal grouping of packages. So within, uh, say, the math libraries, the uh, math SDK, which is called XSDK, uh, contains both Petsy and Trilinos, for example. 
They don't necessarily talk to each other and share the same interface, but they can be compiled and built and deployed in the same uh, application. So that's a horizontal integration, which doesn't really require a whole lot of inter into interoperability, at least at the outset. You can have some interoperability, but it's not required by the SDK itself. So the vertical coupling includes what is actually callable and used within the package. That's where the interoperability comes into play. Uh, it's not required, but we also do support vertical coupling as well. So in terms of the XSDK itself, this is the math libraries. In December 2017, we had a whole bunch of math libraries that were included in the SDK release. This was Petsy, Hyper, MFEM, Sundials, Trailinos, and some other ones. Those are the main players inside of uh, the XSDK. It becomes more and more complicated because now we have even more uh, packages inside of XSDK as of December 2018, and there'll be a new release coming out in, I think, around so supercomputing time will be uh, version 0 0.5. As you can imagine, uh, things get complicated in order to build all of these libraries together. Uh, they're all provided and delivered via SPAC recipes, both as bare metal builds within containers and as modules. Now, one of the things that I want to be clear about here is that anytime an applications person or a facilities person sees a diagram like this, they want to run away because it looks too complicated and it includes everything. Now the idea behind the SDKs and E4S, which I'll talk about in a minute, is that we do the work of the integration uh, so that you as a user in a facility or an application only have to deploy what you need. So you don't have to deploy the entire thing. We have SPAC recipes uh, so that you can build only the components that you need and have some guarantee that they will interoperate together with them. So this is purely a way for us to combine things together logically, but in the deployment sense, you would only deploy those elements that you actually need for your application or that you want at the facility itself. So in terms of community policies, this is an important team building concept, and this is the XSDK policies that have to do with things like providing a comprehensive test suite, not using MPI COM world, uh, having a make system, some of these things are sort of very low-hanging fruit, but these are what's required at a minimum in order to have uh, be a full participant inside of the SDK itself. This ensures some quality improvement, and it also makes people the uh, developers have some uh, skin in the game with regards to the SDK. They have to do some things in order to be compliant with the uh, SDK community policies. There's also a sociology issue here. So they used to be called standards, and we found that any time we sort of mandated standards, people felt bad about it, so they changed it to community policies. And it's the same concept, but if you say community policies, people will actually want to adopt them. If you say standards, people sometimes run away. We also contribute to the ISO and standard groups. So as part of the MPI forum, for example, we have many participants in the uh, MPI forum itself. We drive innovation in the standards. We also have members of the C++ standard and the Fortran standards and the OpenACC and LLVM standards. So we try to take our software contributions and our needs from Exascale and transfer those into the standards as they move forward as well. So in terms of simplifying delivery and deployment, so this has to do with our final stage in terms of the software technology ecosystem. This is the delivery of all the SDKs via a vehicle called E4S, which is the Extreme Scale Scientific Software Stack, uh, which actually is able to build all of the SDKs inside of a single container or as bare metal or in uh, modules for the exascale machines. We build the complete stack of all the SDKs and we have some uh, ideas and some needs to use the continuous integration facilities that are being provided uh, by the Exascale Computing Project. So as before, we do all the integration work, and it's we want to be clear about this. We do the integration work, we do the continuous integration testing, we build the containers, we do all that work so that you can deploy what you need. We really want the applications and the facilities to have confidence that our products can all live together not that they necessarily need to deploy everything all at once. 
So we're working toward a periodic hierarchical and then a release process. So the release process has to do with each of the SDKs as well. They're on their own development, deployment, and packaging cycle. And those all get, to get uh, integrated together into a single uh, product called E4S, which is the ECP-wide software release. And you can go and download the release uh, right now if you really wanted to. Uh, I think the wireless here is sufficient where you could go and get it. Uh, I think it's two gig or something right now, which is what scares people. Uh, but you don't have to build the entire thing. So the SDKs work together on, uh, or the projects work together in terms of the SDKs. The SDKs then work together in terms of the E4S uh, meta package build itself. So this is very complicated. We have some needs in terms of maintainability and sustainability, and we need to have recipes that can be replicated so that we could rebuild the entire software stack uh, as we need and sort of get the, uh, get the same results back. So this also provides a coordination point with the facilities as well as the applications. So it's a single point of contact with the facilities and the applications so that they don't have to talk to each of the individual products individually on their own. It's fairly complicated. It's all managed via SPAC, and we heard about SPAC from the earlier talk today. So there have been two releases of E4S. One was in October of 2018. There was another one in January of 2019. They include, the current version includes 40 full projects and 10 partial releases of products uh, within it. The next release will be at Supercomputing, and then you can look forward to uh, Samir Shende saying something about it at Supercomputing itself. You can go to the website, it's e4s.io, and it'll tell you all about the software stack itself. It spans all of the project areas. I'm not gonna dwell too long on this particular slide, but it includes all of the math libraries. It includes our programming models, our compilers, our visualization, our data analysis, and our data management uh, and IO surfaces. This is actually enabled by SPAC. So SPAC is the delivery method, the preferred delivery method for the Exascale computing project. And it's also used globally for a lot of other uh, supercomputing centers themselves. So SPAC automates the build and installation of the software and the packages are templated so that users can tune the uh, software to their host environment. So this really eases the use of mainstream tools and it makes it easier for us to deploy all of our software on the uh, machines themselves. So it's being used all over at this point, including on the Fugaku machine uh, at the Japanese National Supercomputing Project. It's also heavily involved in the continuous integration project. So as part of the Exascale computing program itself, we are standing up a continuous integration uh, service that will run on uh, some of the machines that we have, some of the hardware that has been deployed for uh, the demo hardware for the Exascale computing project as well as on the full scale machine. So there will be tiers of support for the continuous integration itself. The tiers involve the testing that the projects normally do themselves, testing of the SDKs, testing uh, and testing of the XSDKs. Some of those tests will actually be able to run at scale on some of the big machines automatically uh, using the continuous integration uh, products. This is built on top of GitLab uh, and it's actually being deployed right now at the uh, HPC centers. It's available in beta for some of the projects and we expect it to be useful by everybody to test their software as they move forward. So the automated builds using the ECPCI will hopefully make our products and our integration efforts more robust and that way people can trust our packages uh, more and build their activities on top of them. So, and our hope is that by investing in the continuous integration efforts and investing in the infrastructure efforts, we will be able to deliver a performance software stack when the machines are actually put on the floor for our application centers themselves. So our final strategy is related to our focus on developer productivity and software sustainability. So what we really wanna do is we wanna capitalize upon the successes of the Exascale computing project itself. As the computing project ends, we need to have software sustainability and productivity focuses for moving forward beyond the Exascale computing project. 
We've built up a lot of trust with the applications as well as the facilities. We don't want to give that up. and We want to make sure that we maintain our software ecosystem as we move forward beyond the Exascale Computing Project. We have a number of activities related to software sustainability and productivity. These include this productivity and sustainable, sustainability improvement plans, our software development kits, our ideas, uh, community policies, our better scientific software portal, and our BSSW fellowship. We also run a number of workshops related to uh, spacifying codes, sustainability, and uh, productivity activities. And we talk to our uh, sponsors about the need to have sustainability beyond the Exascale Computing Project. And really to capitalize on the successes of the Exascale Computing Project itself. Now it's just some quick final thoughts. So there is detailed information about the software technology projects. This is available for public consumption via the ECPST Capability Assessment Report. There's a link at the bottom if you want to go and find out everything that's inside of the ECP. It's available for public consumption. There will be a refresh of it later this year. So there will be a third release of this particular report probably around the December time. And so if you want more information about the software products themselves that we're supporting, you can find out everything you possibly wanted to know inside of the Capability Assessment Report. As you would imagine, the Exascale Computing Project is very large, so there's uh, a leadership team out there. This is the senior leadership team itself, and so if you want more information about applications or the hardware and integration, you can reach out to any of the members of the team itself. And with that, I will see if there are any questions.